Hello and welcome to Research Bites with Learner CPD, where we break down educational research into easy to digest bite-sized chunks. My name is Lucinda Pohl and today I'll be talking about Badley and Hitch's working memory model. I thought I'd start with some seminal research pieces into psychology that help us understand how children learn. So I'm going back to 1974, before even I was born, to consider this model of memory proposed by Badley and Hitch. Up until this point, the prevailing model of short-term memory had been the multi-store model of memory, which had been proposed by Atkinson and Schifrin in 1968. At this point, there was a debate about whether memory was just one type of store or if there were two types, short-term and long-term stores. The case studies, such as the famous HM, suggested the latter. HM, who'd had radical brain surgery to stop epileptic seizures, could remember everything before this operation, but was unable to form new memories or to remember what happened from moment to moment. So let's start with short term and long term memory and that what that actually means. When psychologists refer to short term memory, we mean about 10 to 30 seconds of memory. So Peterson and Peterson said it was about 18 from their research, but recent research has suggested it might be shorter and then there's some evidence that it might be longer. Pretty much anything beyond 30 seconds, we're talking long term memory. How much each type of memory can hold is also important. So theoretically, long term memory has infinite capacity and can last a lifetime, but we all know we do forget stuff. Short term memory, on the other hand, can hold very little information, it's very limited. This is usually thought of as Miller's magic number after George Miller, whose research suggested that adults can store between five and nine pieces of information in their short term memory. So that's seven plus or minus two. Though I did see some research recently, and please forgive me because I can't remember where, that suggested it might be even less. Suffice to say, it isn't very much, and this is really important in understanding cognitive load, which will be in another video. Let's briefly consider Atkinson and Schifrin's multi-store model. It suggests that information comes in from the environment to our sensory memory, and this is almost like a filter where we either pay attention or we don't. If we pay attention, the information is transferred into our short-term memory, and then if we rehearse something sufficiently, it will transfer into our long-term memory. If we want to recall something, we simply pull the information back from our long-term memory into our short-term memory. However, there are issues with the idea of short-term memory being a unitary thing, a unitary store. For example, it doesn't explain how we can do a range of concurrent learning, comprehension and reasoning tasks, or case studies like KF. KF was studied by Shallis and Warrington and had suffered brain damage. After the damage, KF struggled to process verbal information. That is to say, he had difficulty recalling sounds, but had no problem recalling letters or digits that were written down which suggests that short-term store might be slightly more complex. So, in 1974, following a wide range of experiments testing people's ability to recall information in different ways, Badley and Hitch proposed the working memory model. In its first iteration, which you can see here, the model suggests that we have three key components, and you can see this on the image. The central executive is a bit like attention. It monitors incoming information and makes decisions about what to pay attention to and which of the two slave systems to allocate tasks to. It has a very limited storage capacity. The phonological loop, also known as the articulatory loop, deals with verbal speech-based information. This can be further subdivided into the phonological store, which stores the words you hear, and the articulatory process, which allows maintenance rehearsal. This is about two seconds worth of speech. So imagine you have to remember a code to the photocopier. Someone will say it to you, say C4983. To remember this, you have to keep repeating it until you get to punch it into the copier, C4983, C4983. If the information is much longer than that, we would struggle to keep repeating it and therefore we would forget it. The second slave system is the visuospatial sketchpad, originally called the scratch pad, which unsurprisingly holds visual information. For example, if you see someone and then are asked to describe them, you would rely on this system. Or if I asked you how many windows your house had, you would use this system to hold the visual information in your mind whilst you worked it out. Logie in 1995 then split this into the visual cache, which stores the visual data and the inner scribe, which records the arrangement of the objects in the visual field. 
So you can see this is the first iteration and we went, they went on and kind of developed it. The problem for cognitive psychology, the branch of psychology that deals with internal mental processes, is that we're trying to describe incredibly complex interacting systems in simple boxes. And of course, whilst this model fares better and explains what we see in terms of input and output, it wasn't perfect. Initially, Badly just put in some links to the long-term memory, but this still didn't quite answer the problem. So let's imagine I'm a child in a maths class and have to do a bit of mental maths. I hear the problem from the teacher. The train leaves the station at 10.30 a.m. and arrives at its destination at 1.15 p.m. How long does the journey take? I need to remember two key times, 10.30 a.m. and 1.15 p.m. Let's put them into my phonological loop, 10.30, 1.15. 10, 30, 1, 15. And then I need to recall information from my long-term memory about how clocks run on a 12-hour cycle. So it is one and a half hours until midday, and then it is one and a quarter hours after midday. I then need to add these two times together to get two and three quarter hours. So now we can see the need for the link to the long-term memory. The question is, where does that complex integration and manipulation of information happen? Because the central executive doesn't really have the capacity Long-term memory is just a store and the slave systems don't really do manipulation. So in 2000, Badly added in the episodic buffer. It can integrate information from a variety of sources, the long-term memory and the two slave systems, and it is assumed to be controlled by the central executive. So we now have the current model of working memory. So why might this be important in the classroom? Well, first, we need to recognise that in order for any information to get into the long term memory, it has to go in via the working memory. And this involves paying attention to incoming stimuli. Whilst many children can do this, children who are perhaps stressed, anxious or have ADHD will not have the capacity to pay attention to what you're saying necessarily. Many children have poor working memory on their IEPs or on their education and healthcare plans. You should now understand what that means. But in order to help them, you need to reduce the load on the working memory. And you can do this by breaking tasks down or writing information or instructions down or having them on the board. We also know that we can't improve working memory. We can train it to get better at specific tasks, but that improvement doesn't transfer to other skills. So improving working memory on a maths task will not improve memory on following instructions for a food tech task. This is one of those issues that researchers are really working on to try and understand, but we're still not quite there yet. Finally, the reason it is important to understand working memory is that it helps us to understand the basis for things like cognitive load and dual processing theory, as well as others. I hope that you found this video useful. Don't forget to sign up to our mailing list. The link is below to be the first to get your hands on our LearnEd Research Bytes blog and new courses. And of course, you can visit the LearnEd website to find out more about our free and paid for professional development courses for teachers. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.